welcome everybody. It's great to see such a crowd for a terrific event. My name is Sally Steenland and I'm the Senior Policy Advisor to the Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to invite you to another event that we're having this Wednesday, where we'll be talking about science and religion to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. We put invitations on your chairs, and I hope that many of you can come. And now I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Values and Voters, John F. Kennedy, Barack Obama, and the Role of Religion in Presidential Politics. We are thrilled to have E.J. Dion and Sean Casey with us to talk about the influence of religion in politics, especially in two presidential campaigns. One, nearly 50 years ago, the election of our first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, in 1960, and the other, far more recent, the election of our first African-American president, Barack Obama, in 2008. For those of you who watch the show Mad Men, you know that 1960 was a very different era. Besides constricted roles for women, widespread racism, closeted gays and lesbian, and lots of smoking and drinking in the office, we were far less diverse as a nation back then. We were mostly Protestant, and Catholics were seen by many as outsiders, suspected of being more loyal to the Pope in Rome than to their own country. Catholicism itself was often seen as suspicion, suspicious, authoritarian, and anti-democratic, which meant that a Catholic running for president had many obstacles to overcome. How the Kennedy campaign handled anti-Catholic bigotry, as well as real concerns about the separation of church and state, federal aid to parochial schools, and other issues is something we'll talk about today. How Kennedy himself answered questions about how his religion would or would not influence him as president is something we'll also talk about. Fast forward to 2008, and you'll find some striking similarities between the two campaigns. Both candidates faced ongoing rumors about their religion. For Kennedy, it was his Catholicism. For Obama, it was murkier. On the one hand, Obama's pastor, Jeremiah Wright, raised awareness and some fears about black liberation theology, which is in the Christian tradition. But on the other hand, Obama was accused of being a Muslim, who take the oath of office on the Quran and follow Islam instead of the Constitution. In addition to these similarities, there are contrasts between the two campaigns themselves. The press and the media were very different in 1960, and so was the role of religion in public life. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce E.J. and Sean. E.J. Dion is a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a frequent guest on TV, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a professor at Georgetown University. Sean Casey is a professor of Christian ethics at Wesley Theological Seminary. In 2004, he was an advisor to the Kerry presidential campaign, and this past year, he was a rig religious outreach advisor to the Obama campaign. E.J. and Sean will talk for a while here on stage, and then we'll open, the uh, the, the, we'll open to questions from the audience. So as you're listening, please be sure to think of questions of your own. And at the end of today's event, Sean will be able to stay for a bit, and he'll sign books, which are for sale on the lobby. So let's get the conversation started. Please join me in welcoming E.J. and Sean. <laughs> Thank you uh, <clears throat> so much. It's, a, it's such an honor to be here today. I, I have been looking forward to this event for a long time, partly because I love CAP and their, so they've done so much great work on religion and public life with the Reverend Sally, John Podesta, who's a virtual Jesuit, and so many other uh, people here have done uh, such great work. And Sean is, <clears throat> he's smart, shrewd, wise, committed, and he's also an incredibly warm and generous human being, as many of you know. So I'm really honored uh, to be here. But more important for today's purposes, he's written a great book. And remember, it is on sale outside after the event. Sean will sign it to your mother, your grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, that uh, anti-Catholic you know, that uh, devout Catholic you know. But it is a really interesting book. And it, in many ways, Sean is kind of the Woodward and Bernstein of the religious question, because he has unearth some very interesting things about uh, uh, the uh, 1960 uh, campaign. He has not found a certain candidate yelling into the curtain, we could do that, but that would be wrong. Uh, but he has found some very 
uh, very interesting uh, things about the campaign. The way I'm, we're going to do this today is I'm going to um, um, uh, begin to ask Sean a series of questions so he can lay out uh, the argument of the book. I am going to turn to the audience uh, quite early because my experience is people who are in a learned audience such as this one, I figure it goes from people who experienced the Kennedy campaign to people who have no idea why there was anti-Catholicism in America because they have not lived it at all in their lives. So an audience like this is very engaged. So I'm going to try to bring some folks in as we go and we'll just go back and forth from up here uh, to you. Um, I would like, um, Sean, if you could sort of set the stage for us by really sort of telling us what was anti-Catholicism like at the time? What obstacles did Kennedy face as a Catholic? Um, how he sort of began dealing with them? One of the interesting parts of the book is, many interesting parts of the book is how he, he was very aware of this early on and began to plot and plan to deal with this problem uh, early and just sort of put us, move us all into uh, 1958 and 59 and bring us back to that uh, time. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Sally, and thank you, EJ, and, and thanks to all my friends who are here. This, this is great, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to turn out. Uh, I was born in 1957, so I, I didn't really – I lived through some of this, but I didn't really live through it. Uh, it's astonishing to go back and see how pervasive anti-Catholicism was in the country in the predominantly Protestant world in the mid-50s. It was so deep and pervasive that even Kennedy himself was shocked by it as he began to travel around the country. He got letters from folks who say, uh, I've been a lifelong Democrat. I love you. I see you on TV. I agree with you 100 percent on public policy. But please, 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 please do me a favor and don't run for president in 1960 because you're a Catholic and I can't vote for you. And Kennedy was stunned by this. Uh, liberal Protestant journals like the Christian Century, which was the flagship journal of American Protestantism, took an explicitly anti-Catholic editorial stand in the 50s, essentially saying the same thing, Kennedy can't run because he's going to be beholden uh, to the Vatican. So the norm in America at that point was, uh, A, a Catholic couldn't win because Al Smith had gotten slaughtered back in 1928, and that was sort of the conventional political wisdom that if you're a Northeastern liberal Catholic, you can't win once you get out into the Protestant uh, heartland. Uh, secondly, there were liberals who, who thought Catholics were anti-democratic, uh, and so Kennedy was stunned to learn that liberal Democrats were against him because he uh, w was, in fact, Catholic. Everywhere he went, he kept encountering folks who were saying, you're a fine young man, I agree with you, you're a shining star, but please don't run for, for the White House because I can't vote for you. So what he did is he started uh, a listening tour, essentially, traveling, traveling the country, meeting with very strong public anti-Catholic voices, and would meet with them one-on-one -on -one and say, help me understand this because I really don't have a handle. And then he began making speeches, uh, addressing uh, this question of can you be a Catholic and, uh, in a sense, uh, an American citizen, a Democrat, and be free from Vatican influence. So he was stunned, I think, at the level of anti-Catholicism that he encountered once he began to make noises that he was running for the presidency. Could you talk a little bit about not, uh, the sort of distinction between conservative and liberal anti-Catholicism? And I think it's important for those of us who are liberal uh, to acknowledge that there was a streak of anti-Catholicism, an important part of the liberal community. Uh, I think Bill Buckley said anti-Catholicism is the anti-Semitism of the liberals. Not in, a good line, not entirely fair, but there was some truth to it. Could you talk about these sort of parallel streams of anti-Catholicism? Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, uh, who was a friend of Kennedy's, also a, f a big supporter of Adlai Stevenson, uh, co-founder of Americans for Democratic Action, uh, came back from a meeting, I think in 58 or 59, stunned from his fellow liberals about how strongly anti-Catholic they were. And I think on the liberal side, the feeling was the Catholic Church was a hierarchy. It was by definition anti-democratic, that if, if the Pope and the Vatican said, jump, then everybody around the globe had to jump and they couldn't ask questions. And that struck a lot of liberals as being just fundamentally anti-democratic. And, and the fear was if you had an American president in the White House who was Catholic, he would be beholden to the pope more so than to the voters who might put him into office. So I, I think it was the, the hierarchical, uh, anti-democratic view of the Catholic Church. And to be honest, uh, there was a lot of medieval Catholic literature that gave intellectual uh, grounding to, to that position. I think among the, uh, the Protestant world, sort of the mainstream and conservative Protestant world, uh, 
folks tended to view Catholics as European and not American. Your leader is in Italy. Your leader is not in Washington, D.C. or in the Senate or, or, or in the, the state legislature. So there was this fear, uh, on the one hand, that they weren't American, but then theologically. Uh, I mean, I remember growing up in a very small town in Paducah, Kentucky. Catholics were exotic. You know, you, you went in. You went into the, the the Catholic Church, and the iconography it just uh, was so different from sort of the Puritan iconoclastic plainness of a lot of our Protestant worship uh, centers and churches. It just struck us: this this is un-American. This this looks this reeks Europe. And so there was almost this kind of genetic reaction by conservative Protestants that this is an alien world, and th these folks have a a religious experience that's really not American. I think was sort of the grassroots feeling on the part of a lot of conservatives in that day. Just in, in fairness to the Protestants, including the liberal Protestants, w the church w at that moment was in transit from Vatican I to Vatican II, and there were a lot of documents that either were or could certainly be read as anti-democratic that had come out of the post-Vatican I Catholic Church. Uh, I was looking for a pr one you cited in here. If you could talk about that, because I think and Gary Wills wrote about this in his great book, Bear Ruined Choirs, many, many years ago, that it was a tale of the two Johns in that period, that John the Twenty-Third was sort of opening up the Catholic Church to certain small-D democratic ideas at the moment John Kennedy came along. Uh, what role did that play, uh, that sort of anti-Catholicism was kind of running behind the reality of Catholicism as it was developing, as you argue in the book? Uh, there, there was sort of a cheat sheet that, that Protestant fundamentalists had put together from medieval Catholic documents, sort of uh, portraying Catholics in the worst possible political light. And they would go back to the 13th century, and the, the classic document was the so-called Syllabus of Errors. It was promulgated, I think, in 1809 by the Catholic Church. That was supposed to be the, the state of the art in the Catholic Church, according to these fundamentalists. Um, so there was this documentary heritage in the Catholic Church that was anti-democratic. There, there was no doubt about it. But there was a discussion going on among Catholic intellectuals, among clergy, uh, particularly in New York, about how uh, the Catholic Church had accepted the American doctrine of separation of church and state, that one could be a Catholic politician and not be pressured by the hierarchy. But that was a brand new discussion that began in the mid-50s, uh, primarily in New York here on the East Coast. And some Protestant leaders like Reinhold Niebuhr and John Bennett at Union Seminary were, were conversant in, in that conversation. And they tried to convince a lot of other Protestant intellectuals that this 19th century picture of the Catholic Church was not accurate. The Catholic Church was changing. Uh, it was becoming more mainstream American. And those Protestant theologians really paved an intellectual path in the mid-50s that made Kennedy possible. I don't think Kennedy could have won in 56 because the state of the conversation was still not fully developed uh, such that there were leaders, there were bishops and cardinals in, in America saying, look, sure, you can be a Catholic, you can run for office. The, the Pope is not going to pressure you to take uh, positions on some of these hot button issues. You can vote your conscience. And now, could you talk about the Republican side? And um, I think that, you know, in terms of the uh, you know, the news story out of Sean's book, the news story may be that there was more interaction between anti-Catholic forces and Republican operatives, though not, we, uh, though not in the evidence here but with Nixon himself uh, during the campaign. And the, this, the book describes this in great detail, and I think it's, it's really interesting. We won't go into all the detail here, but could you lay that out? Because it is, in some ways, would be the lead of the AP story on your book, I think. Um, a lot of people think the religious right was born really in the early 70s, late 60s. I, I sort of argue that 1960 was the larva stage of the religious right, if you will, uh, in that some, some very large leaders like uh, Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale worked with Nixon to begin to fan the flames of anti-Catholic bigotry. The, Nixon's problem was the opposite of Kennedy's. Kennedy had, was trying to, to win as many Catholic votes as possible and keep Protestant Democrats from defecting out of anti-Catholicism. Nixon, on the other hand, tr tried to keep Catholic Republicans from defecting, but had to gin up Protestant anti-Catholicism, but he couldn't do it publicly, and that was his problem. 
So he did two things. Uh, he had an operative in the field uh, who went around encouraging. With a delightful he, name, if you could. O.K. Armstrong was his name. Uh, <laughs> he, he was a one term congressman from Springfield, Missouri, and at the age of 60, found his calling by becoming Nixon's operative. Uh, <laughs> he, he flew around the country. He reported to the chairman of the Republican National Committee, Senator Thruston Morton of Kentucky. Uh, I can never put him in the room with Nixon at the same time. I mean, the, the documentary uh, trail is too cold. But at the same time, uh, Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale were plotting in Switzerland in the summer of 1960 to hold a huge meeting here in Washington, D.C. with 150 clergy uh, in the Mayflower Hotel. Uh, which they did, and they, they communicated directly with Nixon and said, we're organizing these guys. They, they were absolutely the elite of the evangelical world of their day. Uh, the problem was an enterprising young reporter, Bonnie Angelo from Newsday, snuck into the meeting and heard it. Uh, and it was at the press conference afterwards. And God asked, bless those enterprising young reporters. Uh, uh, well, it's, <laughs> it really is it's, it's astonishing and, uh, and exposed the, 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 really the conspiracy on the part of these 150 uh, Protestants to, to then go back to their respective flocks and, and work explicitly against Kennedy. And so, so Nixon really was in a tough spot that he couldn't publicly attack Kennedy for being a Catholic, but he found these sort of behind the scenes ways, below the radar, to try to gin up uh, these anti Catholic forces. Could you talk a little bit about the priest who I, I, I was thinking, you know, uh, the Reverend Richard Newhouse, as some of you know, uh, passed away recently. Uh, and uh, fascinating man. He and I agreed once upon a time, disagreed later, but he's still a fascinating, smart human being. Um, and I, I thought of the young priest who was in touch with Nixon, and I thought of Father Newhouse. Uh, could you describe this fascinating relationship uh, that Nixon had? Uh, uh, for which there's a lot of documentary evidence from the letters. That's right. Uh, uh, Father John Cronin, who worked with the old Catholic Welfare League, which was the forerunner of the Catholics Conference of Bishops here in town, worked for the legendary George Higgins for years and years. Uh, a great pro-labor, progressive priest, as some of you may know. And he was, a, he was Higgins' assistant, really second in command. But he met uh, Nixon back in Nixon's Alger Hiss days in the Senate. So the, the relationship goes way back into the late 40s, early 50s virulent anti-communist. That's what really linked them together, Nixon and, and Father Cronin. Uh, but then over the years, Cronin started writing more and more speeches for, for Nixon. Now, in 1960, this becomes a little problematic if you're at the Catholic Welfare Conference and you're writing speeches for the guy who wants to defeat the potential first Catholic president. So there's this wonderful memo in, in Nixon's files that says, from now on... Wasn't a problem in 2004. Well, but that's, that's right. Another story. But that's another story. <laughs> uh, there's this, this memo says, all outgoing mail from the campaign to Father Cronin's office must be in brown, unaddressed, unmarked envelopes. Uh, and he eventually got a cease and desist order from, from his boss. But what's interesting, Cronin tried to push Nixon in a, in a, a progressive civil rights fashion, which Nixon resisted in, in the 1960 campaign. Now, on the other hand, Kennedy had a, a Catholic advisor, uh, Cardinal Wright of, of, of Pittsburgh, who was giving him all kinds of political advice. And if that had become public, it absolutely would have fed the worst fears of the fundamentalists that he had this big gun Catholic telling him where to go and who to talk to and, and, and what to avoid. So there actually were Catholic advisors inside both campaigns. Um, the, I mean, there's a great debate, as you know and talk about among historians, about whether the religion issue helped or hurt Kennedy in the end. Um, and I have been of the view that in some ways it helped him more than it hurt him because it created uh, enormous solidarity among Catholics that he uh, stole, if you will, um, Republican votes from Nixon from Catholics who just wanted to put an end to the barrier against Catholics in public life and ended up hanging on to enough Protestant votes to win. The alternative view is that may have been how it turned out, but there was a real collapse of the Democratic vote among Protestants in certain parts of the country. Where do you end up in your analysis of this? I think at the end of the day, is Catholicism hurt him more than it helped him. Uh, it, it is true. Uh, in, in the mid, or by 58, 59, Gallup ran a series of polls that showed that Kennedy was the front runner. But then they asked people, did you know he was Catholic? And his support would plummet. As people learned he was Catholic, his support actually went down. And Gallup concluded in 58, he's in real trouble. This Catholicism is going to hurt him. What's interesting is at the very end, a group of MIT pollsters with a big computer and time on their hands uh, came to the campaign and said, we've run this poll that we think 
you might find interesting. If you like it, maybe you can hire us to do more work. This was to Kennedy? This was to Kennedy. Uh, they found that 23% of the electorate was undecided as of Labor Day in 1960. But then they polled that 23% of undecided voters and found out if Kennedy were perceived to be a victim of religious bigotry, that would push them towards Kennedy. So Kennedy completely reversed his media strategy and started talking about his faith. And so the argument was in the last 10 weeks of the campaign, suddenly uh, religion flipped and became a good issue for Kennedy to pursue because if you weren't going to vote for him because you were a fundamentalist and you didn't like him, you'd made up your mind months ago and you weren't, you weren't going to be moved one way or the other in the last few weeks. So at the end, they, they made copies of his Houston speech and mailed it out as public service films. They tracked how many hundreds of times that was played in television stations around the country. So in the end, in that last 10 week slot, they decided it was to his advantage to talk about it. Prior to that point, they'd been very, very nervous, very circumspect about raising religion explicitly on the campaign. But after Labor Day, they decided this is a winner for us because we think we can move uh, these undecided folks. So in the end, it, so it, hurt, it hurt him at the beginning. It helped him at the end. Overall, I think it probably it was a net loss for him. Hmm. That's, that's fascinating. Can you take us through, uh, some folks who have read the history uh, know that in order to prove to um, Democratic bosses and, and leaders who still had enormous sway at the party conventions that Catholicism wouldn't hurt him, he had to enter all the, uh, the all or the bulk of the primaries. And <clears throat> it's, um, you know, the, the, the sequence is that he won the Wisconsin primary, but actually that didn't do him much good because he actually didn't do well in Protestant counties, which he lost to Hubert Humphrey. So then he had to go through uh, to uh, West Virginia. Um, could you talk about that sequence? And I think my only single critique of your book is that I think Joe Kennedy's money may have played a bit more of a role in West Virginia than is ascribed in this particular volume. Right. But perhaps I'm wrong right. about that. Well, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Joe Kennedy's accountant hasn't released his books <laughs> from that period, so it, it is hard to tell. It was kind of a good news, bad news situation. Uh, Kennedy entered all the primaries because his feeling was he had to win them all to show the party bosses he could win. Uh, Sorensen, Ted Sorensen, his, his uh, major advisor, said if, if we go to the convention and it's decided in the back rooms we're going to lose because we're not, we're not part of those folks. And the, because a lot of them are, are some of them are, are anti-Catholic, particularly the Southerners, they'll never let us emerge as the winner. So they go into Wisconsin and they're hoping to, to eliminate Humphrey and then coast all the way in. And as you said, that doesn't happen. So they go into West Virginia, which is about 3% Roman Catholic. So it's really tough, tough odds for him to go in. And lo and behold, he beats Humphrey one-on-one. -on -one. There, there are the, I have no doubt that Joe Kennedy opened up the checkbook and just kept writing checks through, through West Virginia. The thing, though, that's interesting to the me... The GNP of the state rose 5% during right. the primary. Yeah. Humphrey yeah. is really then the one guy who represents people like Johnson and Stevenson and Symington who all want to be president, all want to be the nominee, but they don't want to get dirty by entering the primary. They think the party bosses can still choose them. Why didn't their money go to Humphrey to match Joe Kennedy's money? That, that's one of the things I, I don't know the answer to. So when Kennedy beats Humphrey, essentially it's going to go to the convention at that point. It's going to be Kennedy versus either Stevenson or Johnson. Unlike today, uh, they went into the Los Angeles convention that summer not really knowing if Kennedy was going to uh, come through the winner or not. Uh, there's some wonderful pictures uh, in, in the various archives of the, the West Virginia period. I think. They probably campaigned three or four weeks in West Virginia, which was very extraordinary. Although, uh, as you point out, he had spent a lot of time there over time that's long correct. before. It was sort of far-sightedness in preparing for this battle. That's right. And it, frankly, it's not that far either from D.C. I mean, it's, it's very – so the, the entire Kennedy operation sort of moved from D.C. into West Virginia for that three or four-week period. And Humphrey had no money. Uh, and in the end, he, he pulled out a very, very convincing win there. Yeah, I think but they thought, uh, mistakenly, they thought they had now dealt with the, the Catholic issue. They thought it was over because West Virginia showed that they could win in a primarily Protestant state. They vastly underestimated the power of anti-Catholicism out there in the rest of the general electorate when the election came. There are two more questions I want to ask, and then I want to open it up uh, to um, everyone here. Um, the first is one, something that I never fully understood until I read your book is how Kennedy campaigned as more of a church-state separationist than Richard Nixon did. 
and that one of the ironies, one of many ironies, is that if Nixon had taken a harder line on church-state separation, he might really have galvanized uh, the anti-Catholic vote. Um, and could you talk about uh, how this happened um, and why you think Nixon, uh, you know, did chose to do what he did and how this played out? There were three or four hot-button issues of the day. One was whether or not the federal government should appoint an ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, Harry Truman had tried to do this uh, after World War II and got hammered and backed away from it. Uh, and, and so Kennedy was smart enough to know if he, the Catholic candidate, comes and says, yeah, I'm going to appoint E.J. to be my ambassador to the Vatican, he would have been just slaughtered. On many levels. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, secondly, then, of course, was federal aid to parochial schools. Uh, and Kennedy's own record was a little mixed on that, but again, he was smart enough to know that he had to be an absolutist on that and say no federal money. Uh, and the last one was, could we give federal aid to birth to help birth control if a foreign country asked for it in uh, contravening uh, Catholic doctrine? So he, he some issues never. Well, go they, yeah, they, they never go away. <laughs> uh, so Kennedy was smart enough to know and had enough feedback out there in, in Radio Land to understand he had to be consistent on those three points and. Every speech seemingly he gave to religious folk, he always hit those points. Now, Nixon, on the other hand, and this is the great mystery, uh, at the end of the election, I tell the story, which I won't go into in depth here, uh, an editor of the Baptist Standard in Texas. Now, imagine this. Uh, it's a publication that's read by 350,000 households in the state of Texas alone. It's the paper of record for Southern Baptists. The editor sent the same questionnaire to both candidates on these hot button issues, and Kennedy responded instantly the way he always did. And Nixon didn't respond. And Nixon's supporters in Texas said, you, you got to talk to this guy because he controls a lot of votes. And in the end, Nixon said, uh, you know, I'm a state's rights guy when it comes to federal aid to education. So if the state of Texas wants to take its slice of federal money, give it to Catholic schools. What do I care? It's, it's, their, it's their money absolutely the wrong answer in the state of Texas for those 350,000 Southern Baptists. And that's what flipped, I think, Texas for him at the end. So the mystery is why Nixon didn't have better advice from folks on the ground in places like Texas and Oklahoma and Tennessee where those were absolutely fundamental issues. Had he answered that questionnaire correctly, he might have been president. In quotation marks. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And by the lights of the Southern Baptists of the day, yeah. The, uh, and, the, and Kennedy, if the vote was, count was honest, carried Texas by 46,000 votes, That's as right. I remember, That's right. and that might have gone the other way if LBJ had let it. Um, <laughs> <Right>. the, <laughs> um, that's another book. Yeah, yeah that's a, the, the uh, God bless it. Um, the, if Kennedy had spoken about church-state separation and his distance from the Catholic Church, in 2004, the way he did in 1960, it seems to me he would have been absolutely hammered by his bishops. Can you talk about what changed from 1960 to 2004? Well, well, in 1960, I think there were two kinds of Catholic bishops res with respect to Kennedy. There were those who absolutely wanted him to win. I think of Cardinal Cushing in Boston would do everything. There were other Catholic bishops who, frankly, were not ecstatic about Kennedy, but they held their fire they, they, because they, they realized it would actually hurt the church if they opposed him publicly. You fast forward now, uh, you've got Catholic bishops doing the kinds of things that Kennedy said they would never do in that speech in, 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 in Houston. He essentially said, no Catholic bishop will, or pope will ever tell me what to do in terms of public policy. On faith and morals, they'll give me instruction. I'll be a good Catholic. I'll do what they say. But on public policy, none of them would ever dare to offer uh, a phone call saying, well, Mr. President, you should vote this way or that way on a bill. In 2008, uh, it's much more complicated than that in the Catholic Church today. The, the Catholic Church does take some very strong positions on a handful of issues uh, and I think will exert pressure, implicit and explicit, uh, on politicians if they don't vote uh, in the, the way that the church wants them to. So it's vastly more complicated down the Catholic side. I think, I think Kennedy's answers, while sufficient for 1960, uh, would not have much cachet today uh, in 2008. Just in passing, um, that, uh, Theodore Sorensen was a very important figure in sorting all of this out. And um, as some of you know, uh, Sorensen was a Unitarian from Nebraska. There's a great story in Arthur Schlesinger's memoir, um, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't remember the exact 
wording, but there is some, uh, Sorensen and Schlesinger had worked on some speech for Kennedy, and Kennedy sort of didn't like it uh, because it was too Catholic from his point of view. And he looked at Sorensen and Schlesinger and says, with you Unitarians around, sometimes I think I'm the only Protestant in the room, <laughs> said uh, John F. Uh, uh, Kennedy. Last point, uh, last question, because it's an inevitable question. Can you compare how uh, Kennedy dealt with the religious issue to the way Obama dealt with both the race issue in 08 as the breakthrough candidate, but also the religious issue, which, uh, you know, partly because of the uh, um, question of whether he was a Muslim or not, um, you know, came up in tandem with the uh, race issue. I see at least three parallels between Obama and, and Kennedy on how they handle the religion. Uh, one is what I call, for lack of a better term, technical rationality. Uh, I think Kennedy was flummoxed by anti-Catholicism. He had no idea, and he, he certainly didn't understand medieval Catholic theology. But he turned to very smart people to help him go through it politically. Uh, Obama had the largest religious outreach team of any Democrat by a magnitude of four or five at, a, at the presidential level. He built a staff to help him, help him do religious outreach, and he tried to apply the best campaign resources he could to it. So I see a parallel there. Uh, Secondly, I think they both targeted persuadable religious folk. Uh, Kennedy went after evangelicals and even liberal Protestants as evangelicals and Protestants and wasn't afraid eventually to talk to them. I think the Obama campaign said, we're going to go talk to these folks. We may not win a lot of votes here, but we're not going to ignore them. We're not going to cede them automatically. And I think the last thing that, that linked them is they got over their fear. Uh, Bishop Wright had this wonderful line about Kennedy. He said that, uh, JFK distrusted Catholic clergy, but he feared Protestant clergy. Uh, but he met with them. Does that mean he was anti-clerical? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, well, there's no doubt. I know, I, and he shared that with his father, I think. And I think the Obama campaign at several points could have said, you know, this religion stuff's really a loser for us. We, we just need to shut this down. But instead, after the Jeremiah riot, Jeremiah Wright press conference here, he made the Philadelphia speech. He, he addressed it directly, and that was a high-stakes gamble on his, on his part. But I think if we look back, people will point to that speech as one of the two or three galvanizing moments, and he got over the fear uh, that was in the campaign. So I, those are the three things, I think, that, that link them together. Thank you. Who, um, we, we will have how many mics going around? Just one? Uh, so why don't we take the, we'll work our way slowly toward the back of the room, because that seems efficient. Sir. Yes. Uh, could you uh, identify yourself if you yes, don't Yes, uh, Frank Fletcher, and I'm an independent researcher, mostly focused on foreign policy. Uh, my question is, um, in New England, in Massachusetts, in Boston, the WASP elite identified Catholicism with the immigrants who came and overwhelmed them in numbers and eventually in political influence. How much of a factor was the anti-immigrant or, dare I say, even anti-Irish Concerns still a factor in 1960, and might that might might there be more similitude to that that ethnic issue to to the Obama situation in some ways? Well, the, the irony is the the fundamentalists and conservative Protestants who opposed Kennedy were also Scots Irish and Irish. So, so the ethnic anti-Catholicism of Massachusetts was not the same species of anti-Catholicism out there in the country. Interestingly enough. I mean, I grew up very conservative. I, I come from Irish and Scots-Irish background myself. So to say that you can't vote for this guy because he's Irish w would have had no legs at all in, in the part of the South where I grew up. Uh, but I, I think that was the species of it in, in Massachusetts, maybe uniquely. So I, I guess I'm not sure I see the parallels between that and, and the, the, the kind of current ethos. I was telling Sean and Sally before... Uh, that uh, I actually had a relative who ran on the Republican ticket in Massachusetts in 1934 for state treasurer uh, because Leverett Saltonstall, brilliant wasp uh, Yankee politician that he was, realized that there were now so many Catholic immigrants in the state that Republicans had to reach out. So my, he was reaching out particularly to my folks, the French Canadians, and also uh, to Italians. Uh, and sort of playing on conflicts between the French Canadians and the Italians and the Irish. And dear Oscar Dion, alas, died of a heart attack giving a political speech in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1934. It was not an easy year to be on a Republican ticket. Uh, the lady right behind you. 
Roberta Gluck, retiree and old enough to vividly remember the election of 1960. Uh, talk a little bit about, if you would, Mayor Daley in Chicago and how that impacted the outcome of this election. We, we know, yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, the, the standard kind of street story is that he, he withheld votes in Cook County until he had enough to, to uh, outweigh the, the downstate votes to deliver Illinois. What people don't realize is... 8,000 votes decided Illinois. I, I, I have no doubt that Mayor Daley did his job and did it diligently and did it effectively. <laughs> the reality is Kennedy still could have lost Illinois and won the Electoral College. So at the end of the... Now, that may have affected the... Uh, the general election total, Kennedy won by like 120,000 votes total. Uh, so I, I'm in no position to defend Mayor Daley. I, I don't know what actually happened there, but even if you grant the point that Nixon may have won, ultimately that would not have changed the outcome of, of the 60 race. But was Daley predisposed to Kennedy as a Catholic? I think Daley was predisposed to the Democrat at the top of the ticket. But I mean it, in, the, in the struggle for the nomination? Um, I have no... I have no insight into that at all. My hunch is he probably, well, my, I, my guess is Daley didn't like Adley Stevenson very much. My guess is he liked Lyndon Johnson even less. Uh, so in the end of the day, he may actually have been a Kennedy fan for all I know. I, mean, I, I, just, I just don't know the, the history well enough to, to know uh, the, the story there. To be totally bipartisan about it, many of you know the saying in Illinois, that for every corpse that votes in Chicago, a cow or a pig votes downstate. So there was <laughs> yeah. competition uh, in the counting of the ballots. This gentleman uh, right there. Jack Calhoun, I'm author of Hope Matters, the untold story of how faith works in America. I'm running a 13-city gang prevention network in California. I've totally failed retirement. I just, I, this is terrific discussion. Project, it's 2012, you are the religious advisor to Obama. He says this long germinating seed which is now sprouting, I am a Muslim. <laughs> I, w I, want y I want your counsel. Now the question has to do with how idiosyncratic are the 60 event and the 2004, are there parallel lessons, or would that be so much a unique phenomenon in this country. Your counsel, and you can't say, don't confess till after the votes are in. Let me try to answer it this way. I, I think one of the outcomes of, of Kennedy's election is that uh, anti-Catholicism, by the end of Vatican II, anti-Catholicism was a minority position in America. Uh, there was no bat phone to the Vatican in the, from the Kennedy White House. Uh, uh, particularly the liberal Protestants of the Christian century, for instance, all became uh, supporters uh, of, of Kennedy and in, in, then in the succeeding uh, Johnson administration. Uh, that, so, so then the fast forward, my, my hope is, I, I think President Obama is trying to govern in a way that does not use religion to divide people from one another. For instance, if you look at who's on his uh, Council of Faith-Based Advisors, uh, there's a Muslim member there. Uh, he did consult with Muslims during the course of the campaign. I think he's going to continue to to govern and lead the country in an inclusive way so that you will see a vast interfaith network beginning to, to bud there. And I, I think uh, my hope is then that that becomes less explosive in America's history just as Catholicism became less explosive in, in the wake of, of Kennedy's election. Your question is well taken because the polling suggests that there is still an enormous barrier uh, in the electorate against the uh, election of a Muslim, and they, this uh, may take it may take some time uh, before this is resolved. And I think Colin Powell was particularly powerful on this uh, question during the campaign. Uh, can we right behind? Oh, you're moving with the crowd. Brilliant. Yeah, please. My name is Mike Beard from the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. I was an intern in John Kennedy's office in the Senate and worked on the campaign. And I wondered if you'd talk about the uh, impact of humor on the campaign. I particularly think of the experience when uh, he went to Houston to give the speech. And uh, apparently he was in the elevator with Shorty Powers. And he looked down and said, God damn it, Shorty, you let me put on my brown shoes. And Powers looked at him and said, well, Jack, this is a brown shoe crowd. And he broke up into laughter and was at, at ease and was able to give a great speech because of the humor. Brown shoe story is legendary in, in, in the Dave Powers uh, lore. 
the, the other place is the fact that the for those of us who are not uh, sort of clothing literate, can somebody translate that joke? Well, I mean, ba basically, <laughs> I guess he wore a gray, a dark gray suit, and you know, you you, you should not be wearing your brown loafers. Uh. And and Powers was his bag man, if you will, who carried everything for him and packed for that trip. And so when the senator is getting dressed that afternoon or evening, he looks down. He's got his charcoal gray suit, his white shirt, his black tie. And he got his brown shirt, I'm brown shoes. So he turns to Dave Powers and essentially, you know, uh, takes out his frustration on Powers. Uh, the the cover picture is from the Al Smith dinner. This was maybe three or four weeks before the election, and to this day, the Al Smith dinner is a humorous dinner. You're supposed to give a funny speech, and Kennedy's speech, uh, I won't recite it for you, but but was a killer. It was really very very funny. And uh, at that point, the election was extraordinarily tense and tight. Uh, so yeah, hum humor is, it, it was one of his strengths, I think. Uh, right there, the, the hand right in front of you. Ariel Gingold, Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how we can take the lessons from Kennedy's campaign and anti-Catholic sentiment from the anti-Muslim sentiment in uh, Obama's campaign and sort of broaden it to uh, sort of the anti-non-believer, anti-atheist, agnostic sentiment, especially now that President Obama has been making such an effort not just to reach out to all faiths, but to people of, of no faith or, or who are questioning faith as well. That's a great question. It's certainly true that if you study uh, religious affiliation patterns in America today, the, the so-called nuns, that's N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, Catherine, uh, the, the nuns uh, <laughs> is, is the fastest growing category in America today. Uh, and but, but still relatively small depending on whose numbers you use, five to nine percent of the population. Uh, it would be tragic if you could only get elected in for office today by running on an explicitly religious platform that excluded folks of, of no particular faith affiliation. Uh, I, again, my hope is that the president will govern in a way that does not make those folks feel alienated or second-class citizens because they're not a member of some sort of more mainstream, quote-unquote, uh, organization. Uh, and as he said the other day, uh, the, for instance, his Council of uh, faith Beta Neighborhood uh, uh, folk will include people of no faith, he said. Uh, who represent that constituency. So I think it's going to be part of his agenda. And in, in America, everybody gets to vote in, in that sense. You're, you're not limited by your religious affiliation or lack thereof. I think what it means is that religious pluralism and philosophical pluralism in America is getting more complicated and more textured. And it's going to be harder and harder to govern in a way that recognizes that fact. But I think we we have a commitment to it. I think just on your question, it's fascinating to compare how Kennedy ran versus how Joe Lieberman ran as the first Jewish candidate on a national ticket. And what's fascinated me is to think about how Kennedy, in order to win evangelical Protestant votes, had to say that his religion wasn't important to him. And Lieberman uh, probably reduced evangelical hostility to his candidacy by talking about how his religion was very, very uh, important to him. And it wasn't specifically about uh, Judaism, but that being religious became more important in an odd way publicly in 2000 than had it had been uh, in uh, 1960. But I, I think the non-believer issue is, uh, is with us, as the Muslim issue will be for quite some time. Um, over here, and then, uh, yeah, a couple over here. And I want that distinguished gentleman way in the back with, uh, to make sure we get him in, too. My name is Doug Clark. I'm uh, serving as interim pastor at First Congregational UCC in downtown DC. We are the owner of a proud hole in the ground, proud owner of a hole in the ground next to the Martin Luther King Library, while our building is under redevelopment. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, I was 15 in 1960, so I certainly was familiar with some of the anti-Catholic sentiment. Um, but my sense is that as as in Kennedy's time, he, had, he didn't have any choice in terms of being a Catholic. I mean, because that was his family background, you know, that's what you were. You were, you were raised Catholic, whereas Obama certainly had a choice. And he chose through his encounter with Trinity, UCC, and so on. I guess I, I'd like to know if you have some sense of Kennedy's, of the importance of Kennedy's faith to him in spite of his public pronouncements. I mean, <clears throat> how did Catholic social teaching, for instance, have an influence on some of his political policy questions? Uh, I deal at some length. Uh, Bishop Wright gave an oral history to the, the Kennedy Library. It went into great detail. Bishop Wright had known Kennedy from 46 till he died in 63. 
he argued uh, that Kennedy was a Boston Catholic, and by that he meant pre-Vatican II, very much immersed in the the uh, structure of the Catholic Church, went to mass regularly, uh, you know, and, and and he argued that he was really a pre-Vatican II kind of Catholic joiner. He was a he went to Knights of Columbus dinners, loved speaking at them. Uh, so my argument is, unfortunately today, we sort of have three boxes for presidents in their faith. On the one hand, they're, they're going to be St. Francis, okay? And, and, of course, the empirical reality is none of them have ever really been St. Francis. On the other pole is, is Machiavelli, that it's all, it's all machinations. Everything they do theologically is calculated politically. Uh, but the, I think that the third box is that vast territory in between. Most Christians today are neither Machiavelli nor St. Francis. Uh, and we have, I, I find two people, two Catholics who knew Kennedy in that era, and they both call him a Boston Catholic. And by that, what they meant was he did not want to die outside the church. He was a child of the church. It was oriented to going to mass regularly. Intellectually, it's very difficult to find that he's, that he's influenced by Catholic social teachings. Now, the last piece of, of, of evidence there was when he was president, and John the 23rd, Pope John 23rd, issued Pachem and Terrace, one of the more progressive uh, encyclical or uh, letters. Kennedy embraced that publicly. I think either it was at his Boston College speech or his American University speech, I forget. And he said, if that's what it means to be Catholic today, sign me up. Uh, so I don't think he was too heavily influenced. In West Virginia. Well, that's 1960, right. In 1960, he would have said that. Um, so he was not a Catholic intellectual in the sense that Eugene McCarthy was. And, and so to, to paint him that way. But to say, he was only Machiavellian, I, I think is also not accurate either. So the truth is somewhere in that, that murky uh, middle. Although it always struck me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, his faith may have been less organically important to him than it was to Bobby Kennedy, perhaps to Ted Kennedy, that I think it was Arthur Schlesinger who said it was hard to see any organic connection between Kennedy's faith and the way he behaved or thought about well, things. I think part of that problem I mean, is Schlesinger didn't have the equipment himself to understand what a Boston Catholic was. John Wright could see that because he too had been a Boston Catholic. Uh, you know, Evan Thomas's biography of, of Robert Kennedy makes this argument that Robert was much more devout, much more serious about his faith, and I, I see no reason to, uh, not to believe that that's true. But you know, I grew up in a tradition. I, I tell this. I grew up in a conservative Protestant church where we had three sacraments. We had baptism, Eucharist, and attendance. Okay. <laughs> now, so so when I see when I see any religious person who's there week in and week out, part of me says something's cooking there. Uh, I have a friend who calls them last mass Catholics. Uh, he described a politician that I won't name. Uh, real Catholics know when the last mass is in their town on a weekend. They know which, and in Boston, it's the little Portuguese chapel down on the waterfront. And my friend says, if you go to the, you know, like the 10 o'clock mass on Sunday night, you will see an amazingly strange assembly of Catholics who are last mass Catholics. And that's his litmus test. I think... John Kennedy was a last mass Catholic. Uh, so that's a great. I like that. Please, uh, I'm Mike McGough from the LA Times. Uh, I haven't read your book. I want to. I was really intrigued by your suggestion that the first stirrings of Vatican II and liberalism might have had some trickle down effect uh, on the '60 election. I would wonder if you would extrapolate that over the next couple of decades. I mean, we had this, uh, we, we have five justices who are Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court. When the Chief Justice Rehnquist, who was a Lutheran, died, his funeral was at St. Matthew's Catholic Cathedral in Washington. Uh, w w would developments like this further on from the 60 election had happened if you hadn't had the Mass in English, the ecumenical movement, um, a decline in anti-Protestantism among Catholics, and is there a danger that you're going to see the process go into reverse if the current pope uh, keeps stressing going back to the pre-Vatican II church? From that question, Mike is an excellent person to consult on all these topics. Thanks for coming. I, I have spoken, I've interviewed people who were editors of the Christian Century in, in the 1960 election. And by the end of Vatican II, they said, we were wrong about the Catholic Church. Uh, Niebuhr and Bennett in New York were right. We were wrong. So there's this almost conversion, I think, among a lot of these liberal uh, anti-Catholic Protestants by the end of Vatican II. But strange people like the Ford Foundation 
were funding ecumenical dialogues in the late 50s between Catholics and Protestants. So there were secular New York institutions that brought together these, uh, you know, these alleged enemies uh, and created. So John Courtney Murray sitting across the table from Reinhold Niebuhr. It's an amazing sight to contemplate. Uh, so Vatican Which II, would not surprise us now, but was no, actually but, but most peculiar then. That, exactly, yeah. very peculiar then. Uh, so you, the, it was the early days of that discussion which paved the way for Kennedy then to, to, to broaden uh, things. You know, I, let me just offer one comment here on the comment, uh, concurrent setting. I, I read uh, the two great pastoral letters from the Catholic Church of the 80s with my students regularly, Challenge of Peace, uh, uh, Economic Justice for All. There is a tone there which preserves the, the spirit of Vatican II about wanting to have a conversation and not feeling like we in the Catholic Church have all the answers. In fact, we can learn from the world. And it's such an interesting, open-ended tone. And if I were a PR advisor, which I'm not, for, for the American Catholic Church, I think they need to recover that tone. And substantively, there are not a lot of changes doctrinally or politically, but the tone in the 80s was much more open and inviting of conversation partners and I, I don't see that as much today from the church. And I think that's where, if I were Catholic today in America, I would be fearful that this openness and ability to disagree, but disagree civilly, but still look for points of overlap on other areas where we, maybe we can agree, was intensely appealing in the 1980s and, and just did wonderful things for the standing of the Catholic Church in the United States today. If they could somehow bottle that openness and, and, and spread it around a little more today, I think it would, would be a great boon for the church. Uh, please, this gentleman over, uh, two folks over there have had their hands up, and Sally, just tell me when we have to shut down, because I'm having fun, so I won't notice. Hi, Steve Lowe. I'm with the uh, Washington Area Secular Humanist. We've been around for 20 years. My question is, um, what is a follow-on to the earlier question, but what specific advice would you give a political candidate today who is a humanist on how to win or become politically acceptable? Well, s after 2004, uh, it, it, I've heard EJ say, uh, what, Democrats discovered, discovered God in the exit polls from, from 2004. Uh, I got a lot of calls from Democrats saying, help, help us understand how we can talk about religion, talk to people of faith. And, you know, it, it was all from giving a couple of handy Bible verses I can throw in my speeches, which, which I just, you know, immediately thought was, was stupid. Yeah. Call me naive, but wh wh where I grew up, if a politician walked into a room and there were 20 people in the room and the aide said, you know, on the left-hand side are the five people who would never vote for you, and on the right-hand side are five people who would vote for you no matter what, I'm going to go for the 10 in the middle to try and persuade them. Now, I, I, I'm, not gonna, you know, I'm not a farmer. I'm, you know, I'm not Catholic. I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not, but I'm going to talk to the 10 in the room who haven't made up their mind. And it always flustered me why Democrats wouldn't walk into a room of Catholics or they wouldn't go into a room full of evangelicals who were admittedly uh, persuadable and just talk to them and see where the connections and overlaps are. So if you're a secularist and you're running for Congress, go to the, the Methodist pancake breakfast, okay? Don't pass yourself off as a Methodist if you're a secularist, but go talk to them and say, these are my values. These are the policies I stand for. Can we find a place to agree here? And maybe you'll end up with two people at the pancake breakfast voting for you. So it always struck me as very bizarre that Democrats were afraid to go into audiences of, of people of, of specific religious faith that they didn't share. And, and yet I saw the deer in the headlight look when I would sit down and talk to these Democrats. Now I think that's changing. We all know some Democrats who went into some of those uh, enclaves and pretended to be something they weren't theologically, and they got their heads handed to them, rightfully so. But I think the thing to do is to say, if you're a secular person, you can go in and say, you know, I'm a moral person. I don't share your Catholic faith, but can we find a place to, for, for overlap here? And would you entertain voting for me? Because we support similar uh, – uh, I've never seen a, a politician who's afraid to go to talk to the, the VFW convention if they're not a veteran. You know, wh wh you, they'll go and talk to the future farmers of America if they've never been with 100 miles of a shovel. Uh, so why, as a secularist, <laughs> wouldn't you still talk to folks who, who were motivated by faith? I, I just, I, I'm, I'm flummoxed by that. Just my 30 seconds, I, I think that part of the problem for more secular liberals and people of faith has been a matter of respect not shown to people of faith, a, a tendency to speak down to people of faith, to assume that people of faith do not have a rational basis for what they believe or are not capable of rationality on other questions. And so I think it's, 
it's, you know, the heart, at the heart of being a liberal is not to be a bigot of any kind. And I think that that's a two-way street between secular people and religious people. But the end of my commercial, there was somebody, uh, uh, please. Amy Fried, Op-Ed News, <clears throat> online uh, opinion site. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the differences between uh, the prejudice against uh, the anti-Catholic prejudice against Kennedy, which it sounds a little bit like you're saying has a lot to do with specific church-state concern, versus the the prejudice or the suspicions about Obama being Muslim, and there's so much rhetoric about you know uh, tainting Muslims with terrorism. That's right. I, I think anti-Catholicism. Well, let, let me rephrase. There were sort of two levels of anti-Catholicism. There was the sort of visceral, I don't think you're really an American, I can't trust you, anti-Catholicism. But it got expressed in specific public policy questions. So no one stood up and said, you know, I hate you, you're a Catholic, you're an idiot. Okay. Some would say, I, 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 I can't vote for you because I think the Pope is going to pull your strings because you're probably wrong on an ambassador. To the There's no analogy on the Muslim side. That I, in other words, if, if somebody accuses me of being a Muslim, I can't get up and say, well, you know, I'm – I've got three public policy stances that prove to you I'm not dangerous. Uh, so it's, it's much more insidious, I think, in, in the current form uh, that because I think underlying the, the statistics that the Sally was talking about is this fear if, if Obama could have been portrayed – it's not just a Muslim, but he's a radical because all Muslims are radical. It's sort of one of the, the underlying unexpressed premises there. Politically, that's very hard to, to knock down because, again, it's, it's not channeled into some very specific public policy sides. I think it's going to be a long, long time before our country gets over the, the very deep anti-Muslim visceral reactions that most of our citizenry have. Uh, and it may be – but on the other hand, th the good news is uh, you look at organizations like uh, the Islamic Society of North America. It's been here for a long time. It is not going away. They do wonderful things. Ibu Patel's organization, uh, International Interfaith Youth Corps, is doing remarkable things around America. So there are Muslims leading organizations that are trying very, very hard to, to change and, and to, to turn the, these perceptions around. I have a feeling, while they're very effective, they're, we're going to need their work for a long, long time to come. But the, I think the best hope to draw from Kennedy in, in the anti-Catholicism is, as a country, weak someday can be, where Colin Powell talked about, that it can be fine to be a Muslim and run for public office, and we won't bat an eyelash about that. That's the dream. That's the hope. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work and effort for us to, to get there. There will be no analogy to Vatican II that dramatically changes anti-Catholicism. Could I, before we close down, there is something I wanted to explore with you because it is a very important historical change um, that it connects to a certain coming together of conservative Protestants and conservative evangelicals. Um, the Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, a group uh, that Sean writes about a lot, used to be called Protestants and Other Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. And that opposition, uh, being in favor of separation of church and state, was principally for, uh, or significantly perhaps, um, uh, about fear of Catholic, of aid, formal state aid to Catholic schools and other organizations. Um, over the last uh, 50 years, an awful lot of evangelical Protestants have stopped being separationists in the way that they were separationists, not all. It's a much more complicated debate now in the evangelical world, um, but uh, actually are now more sympathetic to state engagement with religion. Could you talk just a little about this enormous transformation? I mean, if Kennedy came back today, I think he'd be shocked at the reconfiguration of uh, this conversation. Uh, you know, Bar Barry Lind gets nervous when people start talking about Protestants and other Americans being the forerunner of his organization. Because what held what held together the Protestants there were liberal, moderate, and conservative, and what held them together was their common anti-Catholicism. And once that began to recede in the 70s, POAU suddenly becomes just AU, Americans United, and the evangelical wing leaves that coalition. They're they're gone and, and they never come back. I think part of what's going on is the the attempt on the part of, of Catholics to, in, in Newhouse being a, a leading example of that, a figure who tried to bring together conservative uh, Catholics and evangelicals together on the issue of abortion. 
But I think abortion is one issue that has changed that tremendously. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, many evangelicals today want state funding of, in one form or another of, of religious schools. Uh, they're not troubled by a Vatican ambassador these days. In fact, they, they love the fact that, that we have that, and there are closer relations between the Vatican and, and the American government today. Uh, so it just goes to show you that whatever seems to be frozen in concrete at any particular point in American politics, you wait 30 years, and the exact opposite can, in fact, be the reality, and that, that's a, a, a classic case. So we will convene, uh, reconvene 30 years from today, all of us, everyone in this room, uh, to see where we are. Again, I really thank Sean for writing this book. Thank you for being here. And it is for sale out in the back.